What were the main surgical developments in the 19th century? Unlike our anaesthetised operations of today, surgery throughout much of human history was horrifically painful, dangerous and terrifyingly deadly. Because of these reasons, it was usually performed as a last resort. By the 1700s, surgeons were known for their speed, especially in amputations, as there was little, still no effective anaesthetic. Laughing gas was first used in 1799, though it still took many gruelling years before it was effectively applied to surgery. Patients were rendered unconscious for anywhere between 6 to 24 hours. By the mid-1800s, ether and chloroform were being used as anaesthetic, despite their numerous hazards. And by 1850s, Queen Victoria popularised the use of chloroform in childbirth. Later, even cocaine was used as a local anaesthetic. Despite these medical advancements, surgeries remained risky, terrifying ordeals. Patients were often sat upright and restrained with leather straps to prevent them from bracing against the sharp slice of the surgeon's knife. Surgery took another leap forward with the advent of germ theory, hand washing and sanitation improvements throughout the latter half of the 19th century. Surgeons began sterilising surgical instruments, clothes and hands prior to surgery. Added to the mix were rubber gloves, first used in surgery in 1890. With these changes came improved patient outcomes, survival rates steadily climbed. Improving the hygiene and sanitation of hospitals helped to prevent many unnecessary deaths, but the three problems of pain, infection and blood loss were still to be answered. The first of these to be tackled was anaesthetics. Pain was a problem for surgeons, especially because their patients could die from the trauma of extreme pain. Natural drugs such as alcohol, opium and mandrake had long been used, but effective anaesthetics that didn't make the patient very ill were more difficult to produce. Often they would also use hypnosis and knocking the patient out. Nitrous oxide or laughing gas was identified as a possible anaesthetic by British chemist Humphrey Davy in 1799 but he was ignored by surgeons at the time. The gas had been dismissed as a fairground novelty before American dentist Horace Wells suggested its use in his area of work. He did a public demonstration in 1845, but had the bad luck to pick a patient unaffected by nitrous oxide, and it was again ignored. In 1842, American doctor Crawford Long discovered the anaesthetic qualities of ether, but this he didn't publish his work. The first public demonstration of ether as an anaesthetic was carried out in 1846 by American dental surgeon William Morton. Ether is an irritant and is also fairly explosive, so using it in this way was risky. James Simpson was a professor of midwifery at Edinburgh University. Looking for a safe alternative for ether that women could take during childbirth, he began to experiment on himself. And there is a story about how his wife found him and his friends unconscious under the dining table. However, it is difficult to get the dose of chloroform correct. Too little and the patient could still feel pain, but too much could be fatal. This is what happened to Hannah Greener, a 14-year-old who famously was having an infected toenail removed, dialed almost immediately after being given the anaesthetic. After Queen Victoria gave birth to her eighth child while using chloroform in 1853, it became widely used in operating theatres and to reduce pain during childbirth. Chloroform affected the heart and a number of young physically fit patients died after inhaling it. However, in 1848, John Snow developed an inhaler that regulated the dosage and reduced the number of deaths. Unfortunately, Early anaesthetics actually led to a rise in death rates. Anaesthetics led to longer and more complex operations. This was because surgeons found that unconscious patients were easier to operate on. 
meaning they could take longer over their work. Longer operating times led to higher death rates from infection because surgeons didn't know the poor hygiene spread disease. Surgeons used very unhygienic methods. Surgeons didn't know that having clean clothes could save lives. Often they wore the same coats for years, which were covered in dried blood and pus from previous operations. Operations were often carried out in unhygienic conditions, including at the patient's house. Operating instruments also caused infections because they were usually unwashed. Anaesthetics had solved the problem of pain. But surgeons were still faced with a high death rate from operations due to the amount of infection. Antiseptics helped prevent this by killing germs. There are two main approaches to reducing infection during operation. Antiseptic methods are used to kill germs that get near surgical wounds. Aseptic surgical methods aim to stop any germs getting near the wound. As we've said before, they're still using outdated methods that cause high risk of infection, such as not washing your hands, having a dirty apron and having dirty surgical instruments. Surgeons also often conducted autopsies before going into theatre. This led to many doctors wondering why the death rate was still so high. One of these surgeons was Semmelweis. He showed that doctors could reduce the spread of infection by washing off their hands with chloride of lime solution between patients. However, it was very unpleasant, so it wasn't widely used. Joseph Lister, another highly important surgeon during the period, also wondered why there was an increase in death rates now that pain had been solved. He saw carbolic acid being used in the sewage works to keep down the smell. He tried this in the operating theatre in the early 1860s and saw reduced infection rates. Lister heard about the germ theory in 1865. He realised that germs could be in the air, on surgical instruments and on people's hands, and he started using carbolic acid on instruments and bandages. The use of antiseptics immediately reduced death rates from as high as 50% in 1864 to 66 to around 15% in 1867 to 1870. Much of this work was written down and copyrighted and later antiseptic threads began to be used in surgery. Unfortunately, with the use of a carbolic spray it was a high irritant to the lungs. It would make the surgeon cough, it would irritate their throats and it would also be highly damaging to their hands. It wasn't until William Holstead in 1889 produced rubber gloves with the help of the Goodyear Company. This helps surgeons protect their hands while using carbolic acid. The theatres themselves are kept scrupulously clean and fed with sterile air. Special tents can be placed around the operating table to maintain an area and even strict hygiene in high risk cases. Instruments were now carefully sterilised before use, often using with high temperature steam of 120 degrees C. Bleeding makes it difficult for the surgeon to see what he is doing, but there is also the problem that if a patient loses too much blood, his blood pressure drops, which affects his heart, and then his body cannot function, and he dies. 
Previously, surgeons in the theatre and on the battlefield have used methods such as clamping or ligature tourniquets. Ambrose Perret used ligatures to tie off blood vessels, but they tended to get infected because they weren't sterilised. Cauterisation, or using a hot iron to burn the wound, was also used widely. It was very painful and the resulting burns caused tissue damage. But it could be done rapidly on the battlefield. During the 17th century, there were experiments with blood transfusions using blood from animals, usually sheep. We also experimented with blood transfusions between humans, but they were rarely successful because the blood of the recipient often clotted. Blood also clotted if it was stored outside the body. In 1900, Karl Landsteiner discovered blood groups. Certain blood groups can't be mixed as the blood will clot, clogging the blood vessels. He found that transfusions were safe as long as the patient's blood matched the blood donors. In 1914, during World War I, doctors found that sodium citrate stopped blood clotting so it could be stored outside the body. In 1917, this discovery was vital when the first ever blood bank was set up at the Battle of Cambrai. In 1946, the British National Blood Transfusion Service was established and we now have blood donations today.